This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, ride, ride. Are you living your purpose? Or are you still struggling to find out what it is? I believe that we're all here for a reason, and all of our reasons are different. Discovering our purpose is part of the journey that we are here to experience. Getting started on this journey can be a little bit tricky, and a great first step is with Rick Highland's book, Live Your Purpose. Hi, Rick. Lucy, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? Oh, awesome. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Finding purpose I'm, I'm finding this topic is coming up more and more lately, yes. but more from the perspective that people are searching for it. It's, it's a holy grail that people are trying to find. Yeah, this, and it's little doubt. You know, I just read a, a piece of research, Lucy, just recently that showed it was actually published in 2019. So before COVID, so uh, which I think adds even more credibility to the research, but basically it says that people can recover from a crisis five times faster when they live with clear purpose. So it's no doubt that people after COVID or as we're starting to pull out of COVID are really uh, wanting to find and live with purpose. How would you define our purpose? So I, I I would go very basic and say it's something to live for. And I include in purpose Uh, the values you want to live by. So I think a good purpose statement captures both. Uh, You know, what are you about? Why are you about? And how do you want to live your best life? Is it, you know, I think in some ways, a lot of people are, are searching for something and they're not finding it. And I think it's because they're caught up in, purpose is this magnificent thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because uh, in the research, it's interesting when uh, I, I'm 59 years old now, I wrote my purpose statement or the first draft of it. It has been revised a couple times since there when I was in an MBA program uh, when I was 27 years old. But um, it is, uh, the research does show when I went to write the book, the research shows that there is some anxiety to writing a purpose and coming up with a purpose. And part of it, I think, is our perfectionist mentality, right? I have to get it perfect. And how do I do it? And so I think the how question is a really important one. I think people are figuring out the why, uh, that it is important, um, but it's the how that's so important. And that's why I actually, one of the reasons I wrote the book, Lucy, is because I spent 32 years as a management consultant after my MBA, basically as an implementation or execution consulting firm and uh, figuring out the how. It's great to, you know, a consultant comes in and tells you what you need to do in your business and then it's up to you to figure it out where the consulting company that I belong to for 32 years figured out the hows. And so when I went to write this book last year, I really wanted to go and figure out the how to do. Based on my own experience as a 27 year old, And then later, and so chapter three of the book is actually, uh, I called it the triple seven process, seven questions over seven days and seven journal writing experiences uh, to figure out the how. And so that that's the real magic, I think. In fact, Lucy, I had no intention to write a book as I went to retire from my full time consulting. I thought, how can I add? How can I give contribution? How can I give back now? And I thought, well, you know, what is my strength? Well, I, I figured out this purpose thing many years ago. And so I really wanted to kind of teach people how, but I was kind of frozen. You know, I'm not the best author. I'm more a public speaker. And, uh, but I read this little book um, called How to Write a Book in 90 Days. And it laid out for me, it was such a simple book. It laid out for me the how, and it completely you know, unfroze my brain about writing a book. It showed me, you know, on guru.com, you can get this, you can get this editor here. 
and all these resources that could help me put together this book. So that's what I attempted to do in this book is exactly that is, is teach people the how so it could unfreeze this idea that let's go and define purpose. If we could just step back and look at, you know, you said that you wrote your first purpose statement at 27. So if you're going back to your 27 year old self, how did that help define or shape your life having that purpose statement? Yeah, good question. I'll tell you the story about it. And I hope there's a couple lessons that are valuable for listeners. And one of them is, is that during confusing or discouraging or times of dissonance inside when we're trying to figure out our purpose or our next steps in life, that out of that can come some magic, can come some gold. So I had moved my family across country and um, we had two kids at the time, two little kids, four and two. And uh, it was a big move, a big decision to go out into the MBA program and, and not too far from you in London, Ontario. And um, I knew I was the youngest and one of the least experienced in the class, but uh, so I doubled down and I knew I had to work hard and we moved right next to the university. So it was walking distance. And so I could just spend a lot of time in the library and studying. So long story short, five weeks in, six weeks in the program, um, I get one of the lowest grades in the economics class by a professor named Don. And it was just like Friday uh, afternoon, I got it back. And it was a little mini moment of crisis. Like I moved my family across the country. I'm working as hard as I can. I don't know if I can work any harder. And uh, so Saturday morning, I woke up with a, a little bit of renewed sense of hope. And I remembered uh, one of my heroes, one of my mentors in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen R. Covey, uh, his chapter, or, or he called it his habit too, was begin with the end in mind. And he talked about the importance of a written, articulated mission or purpose statement. And so I thought, you know what, maybe that's what I need to do. What have I got to lose? I'm working as hard as I can. Maybe this will help me work smarter. And so that weekend, I actually, you know, in our little un unfinished basement in Platts Lane in London, Ontario, I worked on my first draft of my mission statement. And I didn't really worry about having it perfect. I had some words in there that I felt comfortable and confident with. And, you know, come Monday morning, I went back to school with a, a I don't remember any uh, flashing lights or bells or whistles like, oh, this is amazing. This is going to change my life. But I will tell you, um, when it came recruiting time a year and a half later, this is where the kind of story gets interesting, is um, I was applying for jobs. Nothing looked interesting. Even the couple I did apply for, I, I didn't get a, a posting for or an interview for. And then all of a sudden, one day, a small boutique uh, consulting firm from Vancouver, Canada was recruiting there. And Lucy, in that statement, description of the company and what they do had the exact same terms that I had drafted up a year and a half before in this purpose statement. And it had words like continuous improvement, action orientation, uh, make a difference in people's lives, on-site coaching. And so I, I just I went home to Cheryl and said, I, I, I applied to my dream job. It's amazing. All this work has been worth it, blah, blah, blah. Well, I go back to school the next day and this is before internet, right? So I go back on the, on the wall in the recruiting office and look at the interview slots and I'm not on the list. And uh, I was devastated, but before I could get too down that afternoon after class, I phoned the headquarters and they said, I don't know if I was this bold, but maybe I was. They said that I called up and said, oh, excuse me, uh, I applied for your job and I think you made a mistake because I wasn't on the list for an interview. And uh, so they looked up my name and my resume and they said, well, Mr. Highland, you're a little young and a little inexperienced. But and so I thought at that point, I didn't have anything to lose. So I said, hey, you know, let me tell you about this experience I had a year and a half before. And I, I, I wrote this purpose statement. And I began with the end in mind and and I'm all about continuous improvement, action orientation, making a difference. And they said, well, OK, kid, you sound sound like you've uh, got some chutzpah here. Let's uh Put your name, write your name on the wall, number 11, 5 p.m., and you can get an interview. And I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> so I don't know if, I think it was a couple of weeks later, they came to the school. And long story short, I was the only one to get the job. And um, I went on and spent 32 years with that company and retired as the second largest shareholder and the CEO of the company. But um, I, I, I credit that 
to uh, just living out and articulating my end in mind, my purpose. And when I went to write the book, I found out that, oh my goodness, besides career choice, which, because in your purpose statement, it doesn't say, you know, you're going to be a consultant and you're going to blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, there's all this in the research, Lucy, all, all I found 10 health, mental, physical health benefits to living with purpose. It's, you know, psychological well-being, less hospital time, longer life, better well-being, all this stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's, um, that's kind of my personal journey. And then to, you know, consult the big business for many years on execution and how and helping companies live their purpose. So that's, that's why I had to write the book. And that's why purpose is so important to me. There's definitely quite a lot of lessons packed into that story. Yes. And, and I think everybody can relate to either all of it or certain aspects of it. But I'm curious, do you think that by writing your purpose statement, it aligns you with what you were meant to be doing? Absolutely. You know, that, that's one of my favorite questions in the 777 process is, you know, you ask, you know, what are your strengths? But one of my favorite and that feedback I've got from people that have gone through this process now over the last couple of years is that they love the question of um, imagine, and this is actually question one of the seven uh, steps in the process. Imagine you're at your funeral. You can't control what people say, but what do you want them to say? If you're attending, your family members, your close friends are talking, and what are they saying? What are they talking about? Rick was, Lucy is, Lucy lived life. And so it really helps you think your best self and how you want to be remembered. And then, of course, the magic and the tricky part, and, and I do address this in the book as well, is then you have to reverse engineer and bring back to today. What does that mean for today? If that's how I want to be remembered, that's how I want to live. That's my best self. I still have to reverse engineer it back to articulate it well so that I can be proactive and be intentional every day. And that doesn't mean you don't make mistakes, and, but it does mean you're living intentionally and with purpose. And how would you describe living intentionally? How is that um, different than just getting up every day, uh, you know, reliving the same day over, you know, the Groundhog Day. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's really important to distinguish. There's a couple of parts of purpose. There's big P purpose, this overarching purpose that I'm talking about with an articulated uh, statement. But um, it just gives you tons of hope when you can live with a clear end in mind, even when you do make mistakes of, okay, let me get back up. There's also a little P purpose, Lucy, that I just wanted to mention that fits into your question. Uh, I did a piece of research with 1,400 people, and I asked them questions about best life. I asked them questions about both this triangle of being both happy and productive and successful, and I'm um, fascinated over those topics. And what I correlated is that the happiest people of those 1,400 people from US, Canada, Australia, and the UK, those are the people that participated in it, um, there was three habits uh, that helped them live their best life and be the happiest. And one was daily planning. And, uh, you know, you could, it's great to have a purpose statement, and, but unless you're intentionally planning each week and each day to live out that best life and live that purpose, there can be a disconnect, right? It's great you're a dreamer, you have a vision, you have a long-term plan, but then you've got to have a daily plan to execute that. And, and people got great purpose and great happiness out of just executing daily, planning daily, and executing daily. Interestingly enough, the other two habits were uh, daily exercise, and the other one was to be in service of somebody else, meaning living outside of yourself. And it might have been your kids, it might have been a charitable organization, your church, whatever it might be. But I found it interesting that the happiest people have those habits. And uh, one of those key habits was daily planning to live you, help you live intentionally and execute your purpose. There's a, I think it's Jim Carrey says, you know, when he's talking about the law of attraction, he says, you can't yeah. put it out to the universe and then go and eat a sandwich and expect for it to come about. And I think that's, that can be the mistake that a lot of people make, whether they're, you know, creating a vision for their life or they're creating their purpose statement is they create yeah. it and they basically set it and forget it. 
They just think yeah. it's some magical thing that's going to work its power, but it's not. I mean, you can have your vision, but then you have to work towards it. Yes. Well said. Yeah. And that I actually, Lucy, um, if you asked me, you know, what are the two parts to this book? There's so many self-development books out there. How's this any different? I would say one, I've articulated the how to actually draft your purpose statement. But the other thing is, is I spend the rest of the book. The first third is about purpose. This, the second two thirds is then, well, how do I connect that to my daily activities? So how do my goals, you know, people, there's horrible statistics on goal achievement out there. If you Google it right now, it's like 20% of the people accomplish most of their goals. And I think there's two reasons why. First, they don't have it connected to their why, to their bigger purpose, so that it's bigger than just this thing I thought of in January. <laughs> so, I, you know, because when discouragement and setbacks happen, if it's connected to your purpose or your why, that helps you keep going. But the second part of why people don't accomplish their goals is they can't connect that to their weekly and daily activities. So there's chapters on good weekly planning, daily, daily planning, and all the habits that go in there. So you're absolutely right. There has to be, for people that love process and connection, they'll like the book because I, I go into detail trying to show alignment. I'm a process guy. That's what I did in business for 32 years. So that's what I've attempted to do here is it, the big picture why all the way to the daily living and uh, how to live your best life. And does it help you break down, you know, see, let's just say, you know, I've written my purpose statement. This is what my purpose is. Does the book then guide me through, okay, great. Now you've got your purpose statement. This is what you do next. This is what you do next. Yes. Because I find that's a big gap. There's a lot of books out there that will give you this really great idea and you're gung ho. This is great. Let's do this. And you're like, well, how the heck do I put this together for my own self? Yeah, how and that work for me. Yeah, you. Thank you. And that's exactly what I I'm passionate about. And what there's there's more articulate authors on why, um, and in, inspiration. But I really at the end of each chapter, there's actually a workbook. I I, I leave you with each uh, two or three questions to try to connect you to your purpose. So from purpose to goals to weekly to daily habits. And each section has a work uh, sheet to answer some questions so that you can build your plan to live your best life. And yeah, that's what I'm very passionate about is how does it all connect and how can I actually make a difference every day working slowly towards um, my purpose? The other thing, Lucy, that I'm really proud about the book is that um, it tackles the tough topic of what happens when I don't first succeed? And, you know, the law of attraction is awesome at the visioning end of it and putting it out there and letting the universe or greater powers. But um, what happens when I, what are the skills, tools, and mindset necessary to stay on purpose? Because I find personally the visioning or the purposing exercise is the easy part. You could get that done in the next seven days. I'll teach you how in chapter three. I have other tools on my website to get, you know, that, so that's seven days, but how do I connect that to my daily living? And then what are the skills? Because some people are so resilient and can bounce back from failure or setback and keep moving. And some of us can't. So what are those skills? And so that's what I've tried to do in the last third of the book is to talk about that. And for example, it's skills like gratitude, skills like mindfulness and staying present, skills like acceptance. And so those kind of things that, you know, visioning and purpose, goal setting, weekly, daily planning, and then putting that together with some skills to help you stay on track and uh, be, be grateful for what you have accomplished and then stay present and enjoy the moment while you're still striving, right? This uh, axiom called full and hungry is uh, something that I just love. I think that's the intersection of people that are uh, the happiest and most successful. They're always striving, they're still hungry, but yet they live daily full. And that is such a tricky balance to find. I, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think that's where happy and successful lied, right at the cross section there. And so that's what that last half of the book is meant to talk about is those skills to do that. And I think in teaching such as, you know, the secret when they're talking about the law of attraction, yeah. they don't exactly expand on how to deal with those setbacks and those failures. 
you know, their whole premise is dream it, vision it, and it will be yours. Yes. It's like, and that's why I always say the subtitle for the secret is called and lies because it, <laughs> it does leave out a lot because you cannot, no matter how carefully you plan, no matter how good you are at visioning and affirmations and, and all yes. those healthy practices, doesn't make a difference. Well said. Stuff is going to come your way. Yep. And I think the difference is, or at least in my experience, is that, yes, when you start on this journey of creating your purpose and understanding who you are and, and creating those daily habits, it's slow at the beginning, but then you sort of get to the a cusp where you're very comfortable in it. And it's at that point that when those challenges come up, you don't react the same way that you used to. Yeah. It gives you the opportunity to take pause and go, okay, you know, as I say, okay, universe, what is it you're trying to teach me here? Yeah. Because I've, I've been a slow learner in the past when it comes to these things. So I try to speed up the process for myself. It's, it's a little less painful. You know, what is it that I'm meant to learn? What is this telling me? Yeah, I, I think you've got the exact right mindset and it is a skill set. It, it's, it's, we can all learn it. We just yes. have to ask the right questions. You know, that's, I, I put a journal out there on, as a follow-up to the book and on the left-hand side, you know, at the beginning of the book is the purpose statement and goals, but then each day, Lucy, and I think this is unique and exactly what we're talking about on the left-hand page every day, it's gratitude and learnings. And I'll come back to that because that's kind of your point. And then on the right-hand side is your plan of prioritized plan of the day. Um, and lots of journals or, or planners have the plan of the day, but every page has got gratitude and learning. So what I'm trying to reinforce is the idea that every day I first seek to what I'm grateful for and what I have, because that's about staying present, staying happy, enjoying the moment. And then the learnings part, you know, Nelson Mandela, one of my heroes, ex-president of South Africa, he said something interesting. This is the man 29 years in prison, right? And then came out, um, I, I never lose. I either win or learn. Yes. 29 years in prison. I never lose. I either win or learn. And I think that's your point, right? And that is a key skill to being happy and successful over the long run. Yes, have a big picture vision, have a big why, have goals, big dreams. Absolutely. What, I, what we're trying to do here, what I call it, Lucy, is bring the Western philosophies of dream big. You can have your whole oyster and, and cake and eat it too. And the Eastern philosophies of staying present and mindful and enjoying each moment. So I'm trying to bring the two of those ideas together. And I think that daily habit of gratitude and learnings. So yeah, when a discouraging day happens, what do I want to learn from that rather than I should give up? And so if you're always asking those two questions every day, despite what happened, even if it was a tough day yesterday, what's the blessings? What's the kernel? What's the nugget? And my, one of my favorite questions, if you're really down and can't find something to be grateful for because it was a rotten day yesterday is, what can't I live without? It kind of flips the whole question of, well, nothing amazing happened yesterday, but wow, I don't want to live without my wife. I don't want to let my kid, you know, and all these blessings that you do have are sometimes we take for granted, right? We want to count dollars or, you know. Uh, some big personal best in one of your goal areas. But I think every day, if we can live in gratitude and learning, we're going to be successful in the long run and happy. And I think once you've developed that practice of gratitude, you can, you can tell the difference life before and life after understanding gratitude. Now for myself at the beginning, when I first started trying to practice gratitude, it was, it, it felt awkward and clunky. So I had to figure out a process that worked for myself. Yeah. And I did. And it's, it's a daily, daily practice. I've had it for over four years now. And the difference, once you truly understand gratitude, is that something completely random can happen. And you, I want to say you you see the beauty in it and you feel it in your heart. Mm, good way to put it. And it, it, it happens spontaneously. You know, you can spontaneously just, you know, look at your partner and, and just think, oh my God, I am so lucky to have you. 
I love you. Or you can, you know, you know, for me, I, I like just to sit in my, my yard and watch the nature around me. And in those random moments where, you know, a hummingbird can come just, you know, within a couple of feet of where I'm sitting and that instant where you can see it. And then you just see the beauty of the world. Those are the gifts that gratitude can bring you. It's that in the randomness of life, you see its beauty. Well said. You know, I, my wife and, and maybe some of your listeners, or Cheryl and I are very different. This happens. She's trained herself quite naturally. And I won't say easy, but she can find the joy in little. In fact, her, that's how her brain works. I have to work hard at it. I have to, uh, you know, do this practice every day to train my brain. She doesn't. She, when it's raining and, and we had an outdoor activity planned with the family and she could, well, at least the plants now are getting them, you know, that's how her brain works. And uh, I wish, you know, there was many more of us like that, but some of us need tools to help us develop the skills. And so uh, for the listeners that that doesn't come naturally for the ideas that Lucy and I are talking about are quite helpful. If you can build that skill set, because you know, um, it doesn't always happen naturally for people, but I'm a big believer that, you know, with the right coaching, expert coaching, you can develop any practice. You may not, you know, be the best investor in the world. You may not, but you can learn it. Any skill is learnable if you have the right kind of coaching and the right desire. So, but yeah, gratitude is one of those things that is, is uh, so critical in the happiness and success uh, paradigm. And it's, it's a skill, but it's also a muscle that gets stronger. Yes. The more you use it. Yep. And it's, you know, and it's okay if it feels awkward and clunky at the beginning. That's okay. Let it be awkward and clunky. It will soon get to be something different. Yeah. You know, that's for, for me, gratitude when I started it 15 years ago, um, felt good from the get go. So I've had no problem with it. But for me, my 10 minute meditations, I love the app calm first thing in the morning, sometimes later if I need it. But that to me is clunky, but I keep doing it because I, I know the research. I know sometimes I can feel the benefit. I'm not that good at it, but I, I know it's helping slow down my mind, helping me stay present. So, you know, on one hand, gratitude came naturally for me. Once I learned it, once I developed the idea on how to develop it, I still need to write it down. It's not that natural for me um, like it is my wife, but on, on meditation, it's not supernatural, but I know it's going to get long-term benefits. So it's one of those things that you do. I just keep grinding, keep doing it. And I know it's adding value. Yeah. Meditation. It's gotten, I'm at the point where it has gotten easier. Okay. My husband is the type of person that within like seconds of trying to meditate, he is off in a world of his own. And I, <laughs> it annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> so in a good way, you're saying. He, I'm going to say, it annoy, I'm thoroughly jealous of the fact oh, that okay, he can slip it. into meditation in the drop of a hat. <laughs> yeah, no, not so Whereas, easy for me. Uh, I've had to work at it. I've gotten a lot better. I've, again, I've had to figure out the process for it to work for me. And I think that that's, again, part of the journey of meditation is, is finding the right formula for you. You know, isn't that a great lesson? Even if we're going back to purpose, goals, meditation, gratitude is, is that if, if, because it might not be easy at the beginning, doesn't mean it's not good. And if you just stick with a practice like purpose, like goals, like meditation, like gratitude, and, and find what works for you, to your point, you can have tremendous long-term benefit for you. But it, just because it doesn't feel good at the beginning doesn't mean it's not good. Exactly. It takes time. Yeah. It takes time. Now, Rick, you have a lot of information to share with people in, in different ways for, for people to learn with you. What is the best way for someone to connect? Yeah, just my website, www.ci, the number four, life. Org. So CI just stands for continuous improvement, um, uh, CI for life.org. And I've got different things like the books up there. It's also on Amazon. Um, I've got the uh, planner, uh, the one I mentioned about gratitude and learnings and prioritize plan where you can put all the things that we've got here in there. I even got a cool little thing of guy out of Toronto has this um, coaching, two minute coaching notes, say, say, uh, 
audio sent to your phone for seven days in a row to help you develop your purpose. So literally you to say, I want it at 7 a.m. in the morning. Uh, that pops into on your phone, you play it, you take a journal session on it in seven days, you have your purpose statement. So my vision is I'm trying to make all these things we've talked about today as simple and cost effective as possible. And so that's what you're going to find on the website is all the tools uh, to help you develop the skills and, and the documents we've talked about today. Perfect. Well, if you are looking at connect connecting with Rick, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of the links in there. And Rick, Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Yeah.